The R7 family of rockets is probably the most famous and the most important series of rockets in the Soviet Union and perhaps even human history. Engineering behind this rocket brought the first satellite and human into space for the first time and led to the development of the Soyuz rocket, which has been the workhorse of the Soviet, Russian and even international space community for many decades. Today we'll talk about the space pioneers, the engineers, the cosmonauts, the politics and the betrayal of the R7 program. How many lives were lost throughout the years and how the Soyuz almost never came to be. Strap in for a wild ride throughout history and see how the humans found the way to the stars. With this rocket, Russia opened up a whole new world of technology, exploration and warfare. But you have to imagine, what if another nation had been first? China, Finland or even Australia? It's this very scenario that you can play out on today's video sponsor, Conflict of Nations. Conflict of Nations is a free online player versus player strategy game that you can choose a modern country to lead into a global war. You fight 128 other players in a real time game that can take weeks to complete. So it's perfect for those who want to casually play over time. Make alliances with other players, declare war on your neighbors and take over the world. I personally love this game because of its long term strategy. So I can plan out battle operations for weeks before I execute just like the real life Supreme Commanders of old. You can play on the same account on both PC and mobile and if you use the link in the description you get 13,000 gold and one month premium subscription for free. And that's only for the next 30 days so make sure that you click that link as soon as possible. Back to the show. The main advantage that the United States had over the USSR in the 1950s is the means to deliver a nuclear payload. Moscow wasn't far away from the US Air Force bases as the DC or pretty much any other US city was from Soviet ones. So the Soviets started developing new ballistic missiles with their experiences from captured German V1 and V2 rockets to base their designs off. When Nikita Khrushchev came to power, he made it a number one priority to develop new ballistic missiles capable of delivering the end of the world. That leads us to the first in the series. The R1 was a direct copy of the V2 and the R2 was a larger R1 with a bigger range. But in the early 1950s, Sergei Karelyov, the father of the Soviet space program, was put in charge of developing the new rocket which could put the scales into balance. And so development started of the Samyorka R7. The requirements set for this project were a range of 8,000 kilometers and a payload capacity of 3 tons. Soviet nuclear warheads at the time were very bulky and heavy and this is a very important fact that we'll get to in a minute. The rocket itself was unique in design a two stage beast powered by a total of five engines. The core engine was the RD-108 supported by four Werner thrusters with a further four boosters mounted around the first stage, carrying RD-107 engines and two more Werner thrusters each powering this massive rocket. All engines would be started upon launch and soon after about a minute and a half the boosters would detach from the rocket and form the legendary Karolov's Cross. Four boosters were positioned at an angle and fixed on two points to the main body. When the fuel was spent and they were ready to detach, first the bottom anchor point would release, pushing the boosters upwards, and then only then the upper anchor would release and push the boosters away from the rocket. And then the space ballet occurs. An amazing visual effect could be spotted even from the ground where the boosters would continue to fall and move away from the rocket symmetrically. Back to the rocket, or more precisely to the thing under the hood, 
the engine. The engines powering the thing were a true masterpiece of the era. They were powered by a mix of liquid oxygen and kerosene, and the innovation here was the fuel mixture control allowing the engines to spend oxygen and kerosene in the same proportions between boosters, and therefore maximizing the power and the utility of each booster before separation along with making flight path corrections much easier due to symmetrical weight distribution. And remember, this is the middle of the 20th century, so this is without computers or without any sort of pilot on board. This is truly incredible stuff. The man behind these legendary engines was Valentin Glushko, and he would go on to lead the Soviet space program in the future, but I'll get to that in a minute. With the design sound and all eyes facing towards the stars, it was time for the first flight of this mighty rocket. On the 1st of May in 1957, history was made with the launch of the first R7 rocket as it took to the sky- uh, Oh, no, sorry, the rocket completely exploded right after liftoff. And the second one followed, but on the 21st of August, the R7 successfully carried a dummy warhead 3,000 kilometers into the- Oh, uh, no, it disintegrated as well. But this moment was just enough for Karyov to take his pen and start writing pages of history as the new space race era had just begun. Apart from being a truly amazing engineer, he was also a true leader, lobbyist, and a politician to get the Soviet space program back on track. He actually persuaded the powers that be back in Moscow to let him use the R7 to not just carry nukes, but to go to space. Remember that point about the payload capacity and the size of the nuclear warheads? This is where that comes into play. Over the years, nuclear warheads were actually getting smaller and lighter, and the Soviets, not even realizing what they had when they started development, ended up with an overpowered rocket with a huge payload compared to the American ones. And this is what gave the Soviets a big head start in the space race, which the engineers definitely knew how to use to their advantage. And thus the first satellite, Sputnik, soon followed. Only a month later, the best girl of them all, Laika, was the first living being in space, launched on the Sputnik 2. But unfortunately, she never came back home. Rather, she has stayed in the sky to guard the gate to space for all humans to explore. Tchaikovsky, the father of theoretical space travel, once said, Earth is the cradle of humanity, but one cannot stay in the cradle forever. Further development of the R7 led to a new rocket called the Vostok, essentially a three-stage rocket now with the same engines used for the first and second stage and an additional RD-109 for the Block E, or the third stage of this new rocket. The maximum payload capacity was brought up to 4.5 tons, and the first goal of this rocket was manned missions to space. But before the Vostok, however, Luna 8K72 rockets were the predecessors focused on the Soviet moon program. Luna 1 was the first attempt, which missed the moon by some 6,000 kilometers due to a malfunction, although it was the first spacecraft to leave Earth's orbit or should I say, reach escape velocity. Luna 2 was a success and was the first human-made object to reach the surface of the moon, and Luna 3 was the first to take pictures of the far side of the moon, which you know is hidden from the Earth's surface. A couple more good boys were sent to space aboard Vostok rockets, this time also coming back to tell the story, like Belka and Strelka, and the possibility of a human in space was now becoming more viable than ever before. And so on the 12th of April in 1961, Yuri Gagarin, aboard the Vostok 1, made the first flight to space. This event changed the course of space history forever, getting NASA more committed than ever before to be the first person to put a man on the moon. But it is also where the story took a sharp turn downwards for the Soviets. 
Further development of the R7 base design led to the Vashod and Molnia rockets. Molnia was designed as an interplanetary four-stage rocket with obviously a huge fourth stage, although it had a very troublesome start with many failures. It did succeed to send the first probe to land in Venus in 1967, so there is a success there. Vaskold, on the other hand, was still a three-stage rocket, but made to carry multi-crewed missions into space, bringing Alexei Leonov into space for the first spacewalk. Meanwhile, Kolyov was put in charge of a crewed moon mission and the development of the famous N1 rocket. But all of this would prove to be a mistake. There was a fallout between Kurilov and Glushko who left the project without the appropriate engines. Kurilov was overworking himself and trying to get the funding needed from the government and due to a health issues he previously had, he ended up dying in January of 1966 without completing his project. The story of the N1 rocket is a topic for another day, but the death of Kolyov marked the end of an era for the Soviet space program. Next year, Vladimir Karamov was to be the first human to lose his life in space aboard the Soyuz 1, and lastly in 1968, Yuri Gagarin died in an aircraft training accident. Neil Armstrong would then go on to put his foot on the surface of the moon in 1969 and the N1 program was scrapped while the future was looking bleak for the entire Soviet Union. But this wasn't exactly the end, rather the beginning of maybe the biggest plot twist of space exploration and the Cold War. Despite Karyov's death, in 1966, it was also marked as the first flight for the Soyuz rocket, the last rocket of the R7 family. This rocket which would go on to carry even the American astronauts to space for many years and which was the true legacy that all of the legendary Soviet space pioneers left for humanity into the years to come. I hope you enjoyed this video and please do subscribe for the second part of this story where we'll be focusing on the Soyuz and its variants and the Soyuz spacecraft as well. And until next time, as Gagarin once said, Payekali. Don't forget to join me on Conflict of Nations and choose your own strategy to take over the world. Click the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month premium subscription for free. Remember that it's only for the next 30 days.